A'udhu Billahi Minish Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Jazakallah Khairan, brothers and sisters, for uh, coming here on a Friday evening after Maghrib on a long weekend uh, to hear about uh, one of the hot spots uh, in the Ummah. Um, we actually uh, always used to hear about the Uyghurs and, and, and so on. And um, Alhamdulillah, actually, we have brothers here that would pray uh, prayers, uh, Isha with us, and, and different prayers. And we started getting uh, conversations, getting into conversations with them. And uh, when we heard about the things that they were telling us, and this is casually, every day after Isha, after Fajr, uh, at that point, uh, uh, Brother Abdul Akush, uh, Brother Tuwagun, Brother Aitabar, we uh, uh, contacted them and said, we want to do a program. Now, the intent of this program is simply going to be that we want to share what we have heard because there is a uh, myth amongst the Muslim community that what is happening to the Muslim minority in China is a hoax. And uh, we want to hear from Brother Etabar, right, uh, by, by himself in his own words, what actually is happening there. So the format of the program will be that we will stop uh, by Isha. Isha will be at 8.30. The Salah will begin at 8.30. We'll stop a couple of minutes before for the Adhan. Um, and it can also be an interactive program. So if you have questions, please do raise your hands. This is not a very formal sort of thing. We have a, a setup going of uh, questions and answers. But if you have any questions during the program, please raise your hands and, and Brother Aitabar will be glad to uh, answer the, uh, the questions. Although we do have a script to do a 101 of where is uh, where are the Uyghurs in China and, uh, you know, what is their religion, what is their background, why are they being persecuted and so on. So if you could just bear with us just to set the stage up and then if certain things are not clear, please uh, uh, ask questions later on. So welcome, uh, uh, Brother Etabar. Um, so I just wanted to then, give me just one sec, move this out of the way. So we just wanted to uh, understand that when we talk about uh, Uyghurs, which part of China uh, are the Uyghurs situated? Are they in the north, in the south, in the east? So if you can start from there and also give us uh, a bit of an understanding of uh, um, how many Uyghurs or, or Muslim community exist in China. Because when we think of China, we don't really think that Muslims live in China, right? Um, and also about certain things from your your culture, what are the Uyghur community known for? Is there something, you know, uh, uh, something special? Are they mostly into farming? Are they mostly into other things? So uh, if you can just situate the, the, the Uyghur community in China today uh, and tell the audience a little bit about uh, them, I, we would appreciate it. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes, brothers and sisters. Thanks for coming today to join us and we're here. We would like to hear about the Uyghur situation at the moment, what's going on to the Uyghurs. Uh, that's why I'm here to represent my community. So again, my name is Itibar Artis. Uh, I am the General Secretary of East Turkestan Association of China. So uh, Brother Nabil approached me that I really appreciated his work, his program that he's uh, inviting me today to tell about my people. So I love to tell, I love to share what's been going on in East Turkestan, we call it, and China's call it Xinjiang Autonomous Region, uh, which the China, is there is somebody that raising his hand? Oh. Is it too loud? No, he's saying, yeah. We can't hear? Okay, awesome. thank you. Yeah, um, we call our country is East Turkestan. So our people call Uyghur people. And one of the Turkic people speaking Turkish, I should say all Turkish. And we situated, we located in the Northwest part of China, which we have a border with, I believe many, brothers here, fellow brothers are from Pakistan, I guess. So yes. we have a border with the Pakistan to our ancient city of Kashgar. 
and also uh, we have a border with Afghanistan. Uh, on the northwest part in Russia used to be Soviet Union, but now Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan, and as well as the Turk uh, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. And on the south border, we have we have border with uh, India, and as well as the Nepal. Actually, as you know, the Nepal is pretty much the uh, home uh, uh, country for the Tibet situation for Dalai Lama. So our country is Turkestan. Again, the China come after they occupied my home country in 1949, they named it Xinjiang, which means new frontier. And since then, up until now, it's been 72 years now has passed. So Uyghurs has no right to live, especially for the last six years, starting 2016. Whoever is an Uyghur live out of country, we never heard back anything from our loved ones in back home. I don't have much family or relatives left there because they all passed away. Because my wife, I have mother-in-law over eight years of age, and my her seven siblings. For more than six years now, we haven't heard any single word. Even though we live in a very in the 21st century that communication is so easy and amazing to contact with someone other part of the world, but unfortunately we are banned by the Chinese Communist Party to contact our loved ones, to speak to them what, what exactly was going on in there. So as of our knowledge that estimated numbers right now, whoever calls himself an Uyghur and a Muslim especially, they ended up in the concentration camps. Actually, I prepared a PowerPoint uh, to introduce my people. Uh, I think they will answer your own question in it. And hopefully by visualizing all this the presentation, by seeing it, probably you'll understand more, inshallah. So inshallah, I will start soon. But roughly, I should say that right now, since starting 2016, my people, Uyghur people, including other Turkic Muslim called Kazakh Kurdish, they're also going to genocide. When we say genocide, the people say, oh, that must be a lot of people getting killed. Yes, actually it does. But according to the convention of the United Nations, which was accepted in 1951, whoever as a group of people is targeted, and then if their uh, children is taken away from them, if their language is banned to speak to, or uh, if, they, if they are not allowed to pray, and if they are going through all this killing without any reason, uh, this is the under the genocide termination, it's called genocide. We don't know yet. I mean, whoever lives as an Uyghur diaspora in other countries, we don't know what's happening. If our loved ones are alive or they're, they're dead, we don't know. This is, this is the bad thing that, especially if you're living in 21st century, this is what killing every individual Uyghur people in the diaspora. So if Brother Nabil allows me, so inshallah, I will start my PowerPoint. Let's that inshallah will uh, explain more inshallah. Yeah, uh, let's, by start visualizing. The, okay, sure. let's start the PowerPoint. So, okay. If you can keep it 15, yeah, sure. so I'll just uh, play it for you right there. No problem. There we go. Again, uh, this is the Uyghur people. I just picked some pictures that maybe you can just understand uh, how do they look like. Again, we say we are the old Turkish people. So our girls look like this and the men are praying. This is the kids, we were kids. So according to Chinese, 
how many sparty information. They keep telling all the world, they keep lying all the world that we are only 12 million Uyghurs live in that region. Actually, this is not true. They, they, they keep lying. Because according to our sources, especially the, the, the gentleman name, uh, uh, the professor Drew C. Gladney, is an American professor, he's an anthropologist, and he studies in China, or the uh, minority groups that he, he did some, a lot of research about them. And he said that China's lying, the Uyghur population is exceeding 20 million in that region. Because China's target is the Uyghur Muslim to try to wipe them out and try to, because centrally that region that we have, we call it East Turkestan, is a very, playing very vital role for the, especially for the Chinese economy. Why is that for? Because as you know, if you ever heard the old Silk Road, the, which is passes through our, our country. Because if, if I'm saying the vital role, the China cannot, cannot uh, transport its goods stuff without going passing our, 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 our country. That's why the one of the big reason right now they're doing the genocide against our people. And especially what they're calling is that the, the old individual Uyghur Muslim people are terrorists. I mean, no one can believe this kind of such a lie. Even if I tell a kid that he's gonna lie, or he's, gonna, he's gonna laugh at for sure. But what they mean is that they say that because especially the 9-11 situation, they said, okay, so this is a very good opportunity for us to start the genocide against Uyghur people because they're Muslim. The whole world should consider them as a, as a terrorist too. So that's why they, they, they all the countries, they're, they're accusing them. They're telling them that, okay, we are re-educating them in the concentration camp. They don't call it the concentration camps. They said it's a re-education, re vocational training center. Yeah. Okay, so what the Uyghurs are doing as your question comes to your question, they usually do, as you know, because the China right now owns my country, we cannot do much. I mean, whole world getting fit <laughs> from the, the Chinese, all the goods and stuff. So we cannot do much in our own country. So what the Uyghurs are doing, they are doing uh, livestock farming. That's only they can do, agriculture, and trace if they can. And they are working in a mining factory, and as well as the labor, as working as a labor in, the, in, in, in those, those Chinese factory. Okay. And we are Sunni, we are Sunni Muslim. We have accepted the Islam in the 10th century during the Karahanid Kingdom, uh, Sultan Satuk Bograhan, that as an Uyghur who accepted Islam, and then since then the Uyghur uh, major population become a Muslim since then, and we are very happy. And then we were thinking that we were the loved ones for Allah that we have chosen the right religion. Before that, we were we were uh, I and mean, Uyghur people were following the shamanism. As a religious, like the Mongol, and like the Latin Latin. Mongol, yes, and then uh, the, the Buddhism, and then we convert Islam in the 10th century during the uh, Karahanid. Uh, so when the leader of the tribe uh, he became Muslim, then everyone exactly. underneath became, exactly. which is a very common trait that happened uh, exactly. at that exactly. time. Sure. Yes. So the next slide. Okay, and then this is the East Turkestan map. So you can see this: the red is the China. But ours is in the blue, East Turkestan and the Tibet, which all these areas right now belongs to China anyway, because we separated them. So if my country would be a, a, the free country, the, the, the map is exactly showing whatever I'm showing right now. Okay? Uh, it's a big country though, 
is a 1.8 million kilometer square. It's a really big country. So, and then the, on the south border is the Tibet, supposed to be free, and then they were also uh, occupied by the China. After 10 years, they, they have occupied us, which is 1959. So, and then there's Inner Mongolia, which is still under the control of the China. So on the right side of the map, uh, we, you can see all these the cities where it belongs to East Turkestan. So our, uh, as you can see, the, the countries around it, the Kazakhstan, the Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, from Pakistan, India, Tibet, uh, these are the, the countries that we, we, we have in border with. And then when you look at the, 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 the map on the right, uh, showing all the cities of East Turkestan. So there's a city called Guja over there near the Kazakhstan. That's the place where I'm from. And that is used to be the border for the Soviet Union. And then the Kashgar was on the south, uh, southern place uh, where the where the Pakistan is. Okay, and then according to the information here, uh, the Uyghur population in East Turkestan right now, according to our own sources, and as well as the, I just mentioned the professor's name, we are exceeding 20 million people in East Turkestan. And then we are uh, the second uh, more populated place uh, for Uyghur is, is the Kazakhstan, over 200,000. And then the third one is the Turkey, around 60,000. And in Canada, we have around 1,500 people here. Uh, we are really less. Uh, but the 1,500 is spread over all of Canada. All of Canada, yes. Yeah. yes, yes. We have, in the past, established two republics. The first one is the one 1933 in Kashgar city, in ancient Kashgar city. And it was a very short lived government that it was lost, it was by the Soviet Union, it was the, the Soviets, uh, they were very close tied to China, the Chinese at that time, they helped them and then they sent the troop around 7,000 and they invaded my country. And then within two months, this government had collapsed. And the China, the Chinese, at that time in 1933, there was, a, there was no China Communist Party because they were created in 1949 by the Chinese uh, leader called Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong. Uh, but this is the 1933, there was a, Republic of China at that time. But even though they were the Republican Chinese, my country at that time, because they invaded my country, my Uyghur people, they were suffered a lot because there was a dictatorship. So it was a very short live again. And then the, the picture you see, uh, the man in black, he was the one who, uh, who established his first government, his name was uh, Sabit Damula Abdul Baki. Yes. And then he became a prime minister of that country at that time. And then the picture on the right which they had, he was, he was a general. Uh, his name was Hoja Nias. he was a president. And then this is our second uh, established government, which was established in 1944. Uh, the first one we called it, actually they named it uh, Islamic Republic of East Turkestan, the first one, which was established in, in Kashgar. This one, the second one, 1944, uh, they established and they, uh, they named it East Turkestan Republic. It was established in 1944, and it was again collapsed by the help of helping of uh, the Soviet Union, the Stalin, to Mao Zedong at that time in 1949. 
and it was collapsed so and then it was occupied. So this person is Stalin and that's Mao Zedong for the, for the people that don't know. And then the person uh, beside Stalin, this gentleman, this gentleman here, he was, the, he was the president of our country, East Turkish Republic. And majority of people, they think that he was a hero. And because we have a lack of knowledge about what happened at that time, because the Soviets and the Chinese, they were the one grabbing all the information. They were not releasing all the correct information. And this, his name was Ahmed Chan Qasim. And he was taken by the Russian. He was invited to the Russia. And since then, he never came back. And every individual, they, they think that he was murdered. And also the gentleman beside him with the beard, the mustache, uh, Ilham Kare, he's also the, the president of the Second uh, Republic uh, before the Ahmed Chan Qasimi. And this gentleman was sent by the Soviets at that time to help us. He was a kind of a spy person at that time to help us. But unfortunately, the Stalin, he changed his mind to give our land back to the China at that time. Since like, this is, I'm talking about the 1949. Again, the genocide I just described earlier, according to the United Nations Convention, which was accepted in 1951, it says in the article two of the convention defines genocide as any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national ethnic, racial, or religious group as such, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or part, whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Okay, I would like to open a parenthesis here, the bracket here that, which was, which is right now the Uyghur women, they're facing forced sterilization, birth control by the Chinese Communist Party. And the, 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 the another one is forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Again, I would like to open another bracket here. The Uyghur children, especially whose parents were sent to concentration camp to be punished. They were taken by the, by the Chinese Communist Party, uh, the police or authorities to send to the, the Chinese orphanages to teach them the Chinese, not them to forget their own language and religion. And they raised them as a hand Chinese kids. The, the Han Chinese, for those who don't know, is the dominant Chinese ethnicity. And what is happening now at Urumqi, Kashgar, and other places is that the Han are being called in when the men are not around. So, so think of this. If your wife doesn't have, uh, if, if your wife is alone at home and you have been put, the men of a certain age, uh, 18 to uh, 50, have been taken into concentration camps, Han men are told to come and live in the uh, Uyghur. Uh, 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 ethnic house with the lady of the house and he is considered in Chinese language a guest. So he's going to sleep there, he's going to sit and eat and everything and this is so that the lady who is a Muslim, whether she's wearing hijab or not, can slowly change over time by having a Han Chinese tell her what she can and cannot do. So th these are also things that have been documented uh, in articles of the Wall Street Journal uh, by BBC, Star News, as well as uh, Al Jazeera uh, uh, coverage as well, which has also been detailed on this topic. So I'll hand it back to uh, Brother Aitabash. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Brother Nadir, for your information. Yeah, he's right, actually. Actually, I was about to come to that point anyway. So whoever the husband were sent to concentration camp, the ladies left alone, and then they have to, they have to actually, still it's going on, except the Chinese guests. This is a new propaganda for the Chinese government to watch them inside of their house and what they're doing. If they're praying, if they're reading the Quran, 
if they're contacted with someone abroad or if they're doing anything which is considered threats to Chinese government. And Tra tra traitorous to the Chinese government. Yes. yes. And what's been happening is we heard many story about this kind of issue that those Chinese men, and they also allowed to rape, gang rape the Uyghur women. And a lot of them, unfortunately, they killed themselves. They killed the Chinese guy and then they killed themselves. Because it was a shame especially for the Uyghur women that face that type of torture and a gang rape in their life lifetime span. So um, that's an unfortunate situation is happening right now. Um, in the 2021, the US, Canadian, and Dutch governments are formally accused China that they're committing genocide against Uyghur people. And also that several other countries uh, they brought parliamentary resolution making the same accusation against China. So these all the evidence that I just counted subjected the Uyghurs to forced sterilization for the Uyghur women and forced labor. The people who ever sent the concentration camps, they were forced to work for free. Like in a mining factory, where the factory, you name it, uh, the cotton picking, but whatever, uh, in a, even the was wagon that we've been, we've been uh, demonstrating again, was wagon to get their factory out of this my, my country because they are allowed enslaved labor there. Uh, according to this uh, evidence that suggests that. The China is doing forced sterilization, forced labor, mass detention. When I, when I say mass detention, we are talking about around 5 million Uyghurs. They are arbitrarily detained in a concentration camp at the moment. Whoever you see, I just mentioned we are in Canada around 1,500 people, like 60,000 in Turkey. Two, more than 200,000 in Kazakhstan. Majority of these people, I'm not saying all of them, majority of these people, they are not able to contact their family, their relative back home since 2016. Last time, I myself, I tried to contact my wife's nephew back home. I just sent her the text message. And all of a sudden, she texted me back mistakenly. And she asked who I was. And I said, I am Vitabo. Right after she hung up the phone, probably she turned off the phone. I don't know what happened. She never came back. I don't think she was sent to concentration, but she was just acting that, okay, if she keeps talking to me, texting to me, she knew that she was going to end up in the, in the concentration camp for sure. Because I'm living in Canada, she lives in Pakistan. And this is a situation right now, because all the people, they are so scared to contact their loved ones abroad. Okay, uh, the forced sterilization, forced labor, mass detention, and systematic rape and torture Actions which many say, many people say that meet the criteria of the genocide. Again, um, all the new Silk Road. Why is China doing this kind of arresting many people for no reason, without any fair trial, sending them to a concentration camp. And then they're learning over there, uh, obeying the, not to Allah. They keep asking them, forget about Allah, forget about Islam, forget about praying, forget, it, forget about the reading Quran, but you only have to obey the Chinese Communist Party. Xi Jinping is your 
no. Who's the prime minister of China? Oh, he's the president. President he's of the China. president of China. Yes. So that is what's been happening uh, for the Uyghurs brainwash is going on. So again, on the picture on the right side, you see with the camels, that is the old Silk Road, which runs through our, our country. It's a very famous road, it used to be. But now China, they have created one back one road initiative, which is a mega plan for China to improve their business, to sell their goods to all over the world without any hassle, without any problem. By doing that so, in, in each country, they lend a lot of money that those countries not are able to even pay back. Because we've been living with China, with Chinese since 1949. We know them very well. They give you the ones, they smile at the ones, and you think that they're the best person you ever met? China, the Chinese, especially the Chinese Communist Party, they think really far. You just think about the tomorrow maybe, maybe they might be even thinking about maybe what's gonna happen again next 10 to 20 years or 30 years from now. That's why they keep land, giving those money to other country, they build their, for their own goods. But I believe many of us here, Pakistani, I, I believe so, the port, Gwadar port, the Karachi. As, Gwadar port, Gwadar port, not Karachi. Yeah, Gwadar port. This was built and then was assigned to China to use them for that mega plan. And the China has landed a lot of money to Pakistan for to the Imran Khan, unfortunately. And he's not recognizing the Uyghur genocide whatsoever. He, he even hasn't even heard about it. I mean, not even the Pakistan, the, all the Muslim countries, none of the Muslim countries, none of the single Muslim country came out saying that, hey, China, stop doing genocide against Muslim Uyghur people. They didn't even say that, hey, stop China burning the Quran. The Quran is not for the Uyghur, Uyghur people, but all for all humanity. Why the heck? You are burning my Quran, my book. And no one's saying that. Unfortunately, brothers and sisters, at this time, the Muslim governments, don't get me wrong, I'm not blaming any Muslim. I know you guys are with us, but I mean, the, all the Islam country, the governments, they should act. Because they have a lot of money received from China, they cannot say anything back to China. They know that what is going on to our people, even though many of our people, especially who went to Egypt, uh, the other Arab countries, they were returned, forced to return back to China. And what China did was they took them, they grabbed them and they put them in jail. Or maybe they murdered them just like by when they, when, they, when they passed the board. This is the shame thing for the all the, the especially the Islam country, the Muslim country is doing this to us, and this is not acceptable. Inshallah, Allah will guide them to find the right path. Inshallah. This, this is our prayer. So again, this is the Uyghur genocide I just mentioned. When you see the pictures, huh, on the, uh, the Chinese guy marrying the Uyghur girl. Please look at carefully look at the Uyghur girl's face. It's supposed to be her best day, the happiest day, because she was married to someone. She's crying there. Why? Because she's forced to marry this Chinese guy. If she does not marry the Chinese guy, her family will be punished. They will end up in, in jail or concentration camp, or they might be losing their job. This is the advantage that China is taking over uh, because they have a lot of money. Uh, on, the, on the other picture, you can see those people, the men, they're in the concentration camp. This is how the concentration, which the China is called a vacational training center, 
This looks like a jail. No one can say that this is an education center anyway. And no one is allowed to get in there. Even the journalists, they try to get in there. They cannot even touch the walls. They're not allowed to go there, no way. And this is really describes what is really going on on the Muslim, Muslim people by the Chinese surveillance systems that they are, by just Brother Nabi mentioned, the guy, the Chinese guys placed in the Uyghur's home, try to monitor them. In and out, every move that Uyghurs will take, they has to be reported to the core headquarters. Every couple of hundred meters, there's a checkpoint that each individual Uyghur, not the Han Chinese, the Uyghurs, because we look very different from Chinese, they will recognize us right away. That hey, you are Uyghur, come this side. And they have to check your phone. They have to open your phone, make sure your phone has anything in it to send you to, 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 to jail or the concentration camps. Again, Uyghur children are forced to separate their parents. They're placed in all Chinese orphanages. They're being taught Chinese, Chinese culture. And they're singing Chinese songs. And then they obey the Chinese Communist Party and they said, Xi Jinping is our God. And look at the picture. The picture in the, in the middle, the, at, the, at the bottom. Those, those are not Chinese kids. These are the Uyghur kids. They're wearing the clothes like a Chinese kids wear. They had a shade. They said, okay, now you're Chinese. Okay, you try to dance the way the Chinese does. And then this poor father, he lives in Turkey because he had to leave Turkey because otherwise he wouldn't be arrested and going to jail in a concentration camp. And now he's seeking his kids that where my kids are because his kids are sent to the Chinese orphanages already. And as you can see, these kids are, they're forcibly, they're being taught Chinese. And we were forced labor. Our country is very well known for the cotton, producing the cotton. One of the fifth, huh? But the cotton produced in our region, in East Turkestan, they call it Xinjiang. And unfortunately at the moment, the forced labor is being used. And then a lot of brand, uh, brand or uh, those brand company, they're using, uh, uh, they, they, they used to use uh, our cotton. But we try to raise awareness for this, for this, uh, uh, well-known brand co uh, companies that try not to use the slave labor production of these cottons that come from our region. And, and brother Edward, they have listened though, right? H&M, Nike. Some of them listened, but some of them still were struggling to tell them the truth that they should get away from this one. But inshallah, slowly, they will uh, not get all this, the cotton from our region for sure, inshallah. Right. And then we were ethnic cleansing. We are not allowed to speak our own language, which we used to speak our own language. We had our own school, even though during this communist party regime time, I'm talking about 1980s to 1990s, we had our own school. And we were teaching our kids our own culture, uh, our own religion, and they were speaking our own language. At that time we were happy. To be honest, I have to tell you the truth. Because at that time, I and mean, compared to this time right now, so I mean that time was 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 really it wasn't good because I married my wife because I'm also I'm I'm from Turkey. I'm a Uyghur, but I'm from Turkey. I lived in Turkey for 26 years. And I went back in 1993 to marry my wife. At that time it was okay. And we're just getting the visa from China. And then we just do whatever we need to do. But again, coming to 
So our people live in that region. They have to survive for somehow because if you are, as a Uyghur, if you're not speaking Chinese language, the Mandarin language, you're not allowed to get a job. No way, forget about it. Because that is one of the repression of Uyghurs, Uyghur minority to learn the Chinese language to get a job. The mosques are being demolished. Especially the mosque that on the right corner with the yellow color. That is the Hitka Masjid in city, ancient city Kashgar. It's very old, very old mosque and a very well-known mosque for the entire our region. In 2016, it has a Quranic verses on the door and 20, 2019 it was removed. And now this mass, if you go to Kashgar, especially I'm talking, I'm talking to the Pakistani brothers and sisters who can just pass by, go to the Kashgar, try to get into the mass, masjid, Hedgar masjid, and try to pray. You just tell, because there is a security guard around it. You're not allowed to get in without, you, just, you, you, you cannot just tell them, hey, this mass, I'm, I'm going to pray. They said, no, this is not a mosque anymore. This is just go see inside, just walk around, is an exhibition center. Yeah, it's a cultural heritage site based yeah. on what they mentioned. Yes. So the old surveillance cameras around it, that no one can do anything about it. If you want to pray, you cannot pray there. Again, according to the, all these Google pictures, that like uh, all of these mosques are demolished. The first there was a mosque, and then right after the picture was taken, the, the picture of uh, the pictures that the master's gone. No more, no more master. And the Uyghur woman sterilization. The Uyghur women, they're forcibly getting this sterilization to uh, especially the women who are who staying in the concentration camps. Uh, we have a couple of witnesses here. The, the lady with the, the red scarf, and then with the black scarf, uh, they were actually witnessed it, that in front of their eyes, the Uyghur women, they gang raped and they get a sterilization because they are taking the pills. Once they get into the concentration camp, they have to do their blood work done and they have, they have to do the ultrasound, make sure they're not pregnant. If they're pregnant, yeah, right away they're taken away. They take them to hospital and then get the child removed. And this is doing forcibly to each individual who is pregnant. And if the lady, the girl is not pregnant, they sterilize them, unfortunately. And these are we call them our heroes. These are the former detainees who stay in concentration camps. The gentleman with the hat, Omer Bekali, he's a Kazakh background, he, but his wife is Uyghur. He stayed in the concentration camps because uh, he's a Kazakh background and he had family member in Kazakhstan, he was released. And then he came to Europe and he became a witness of all these people, uh, he's, he's giving all these testimonies. And then the lady beside it, Tursunay Ziaudun, and then the lady beside it, the Mihribil Tursun, and then Gulbahar Jalilova, and Kalbinur Siddiq, and Zumetan. These were the former detainees who were released by the Chinese or who, were, who escaped from these concentration camps. So just, it's going to be last one. Okay. So brothers and sisters, you have listened to the so far. Thank you very much for listening. So if you come to the conclusion, what can we do for Uyghurs? Of course, I'm gonna ask you the basic one is please make a dua for us. That is the, the least amount you can do for us. And then the rest, 
what you can do. Please raise awareness of the Uyghur genocide to every individual person you know around you. And please talk to or write a, uh, send an email to each of your MPs to bring this Uyghur genocide to the government's attention. Because as you know, last February, the Canadian parliamentary has accepted it was a genocide, but not the government, uh, unfortunately. So we have to force the government, the Canadian government, to recognize the Uyghur genocide. And if you can, you can attend the Uyghur protest against China because which we've been doing, I've been living in this country for 21 years. So each year we have a couple of demonstrations against in front of the Chinese council in Toronto that we try to raise awareness, we will be protesting them. So if you have a time, please join us, please contact us whenever we have a protest and we will inshallah, we will uh, be happy to see you there. And then please boycott the Chinese goods. I know whatever you buy right now is made in China. Please from now on, brother, this is maybe you can do at least maybe another thing that you can do. Don't buy the Chinese goods that says made in China. Now they are using another term, PRC, made in PRC. What does PRC mean? People, Republic of China. Because a lot of people don't know about it. They, said, they, they just see made in China, okay, that's clear. But now they're using the term PRC, made in PRC. People, Republic of China. And then sometimes we do have a petition going around, around the world that you may, you may sign this petition and then also encourage your friends and family members to sign it as well. And then also, we have recently opened up Uyghur mosque in, within the Hamilton border. And we call this place mosque. Of course, inshallah, sooner will be opening for five times for prayer. And also, we are also using this place, a gathering place for our own people to teach our kids the religion, and all, our own culture, and all language. And then this is very important. This is the girl that I especially have chosen to show you that probably many of you guys, especially the young kids and girls, they know her, probably they know her, but she's from TikTok, that she has become very famous because she was raising our Uyghur situation that she was just pretending she was doing, doing makeup in front of TikTok because she raised big awareness like she, probably millions of people watched her. By doing makeup, she raised her awareness on Uyghur genocide, that what was going on for Uyghurs at the moment. Please share these, all these ideas in a social media account as well. And inshallah, brother, the last thing is, the follow our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam hadith that become one ummah. I am a Uyghur. You are a Pakistani. You are Turkish. You are from other background. We are all called one ummah according to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah for that, uh, Brother Itabar. Actually, I'd given him a script and I, we thought we'd go back and forth, but every single question that I had, he answered via the presentation, which I think is uh, great. Um, so I, at this point, also wanted to recognize because uh, Brother Itaba would not be here. His masjid two, three weeks ago in uh, uh, west side of Hamilton was opened up and uh, Brother Taha Gayu, who's the uh, um, executive director for Justice for All, uh, met him. And that is how we we connected and had uh, uh, Brother Etebar come here and speak. So 
Uh, I just want to recognize Brother Taha Gayur's organization. Brother Taha Gayur's organization is called Justice for All. Uh, it is a Canadian human rights organization with consultative status at the United Nations, DPI, advocating on behalf of indigenous minorities facing oppression, crimes against humanity, and genocide. It is the only, let me repeat, it is the only Muslim-led advocacy organization working in the human rights space today, focused on defending Muslim minorities around the world. Justice for All Canada currently runs at several advocacy campaigns, including Burma Task Force, Save Uyghur, Free Kashmir, Save India, Sri Lanka Task Force, and Muslim Indigenous Campaigns. Justice for All has launched its Save Uyghur campaign over four years ago, and it continues to play a leading role in pushing the Canadian government to take decisive action in ending the Uyghur genocide. And to learn more, you can actually go to www.justiceforallcanada.org or their campaign, which actually is uh, the uh, Save Uyghur campaign. And I'll just uh, display that. I have a question. Yes, please. We can start questions uh, as well. I just wanted to know how the, this issue is uh, raised with the Muslim woman because we have uh, just last one very disturbing uh, uh, news from Morocco. Uh, Idris, Idris Hassan or Idris, he was detained there. He was going to Turkey. On the way to Turkey, he was detained because he, he, is, he was activist. For the Uyghur. And of course, the Morocco is a Muslim country. He has been detained there. And I have no idea, but we were getting the news he will be deported to China. And after that, we, we got too many feedbacks, even the, from Saudi Arabia, from Turkey, from Kuwait, some of the activists they have been deported. Right. So just repeating the question for those who are online the question uh, from Brother Sajid was that there are people uh, from Morocco, uh, Turkey, who are Uyghur uh, ethnicity, who are actually traveling for, to these countries and they actually get picked up, they get detained and they're getting sent back or deported to China. This is actually not new. We know not only of Morocco and Saudi Arabia and Turkey, but other countries where Uyghur activists, I think one thing that also has to be known, when this event was planned with Brother Taha, myself, and uh, Ikna al we uh, the Ikna al chapter, we, we uh, did not have registration. Then based on COVID protocol, we were told we need to have a registration. When I sent the registration link to uh, Brother uh, uh, Abdullah Kush and uh, Abd Brother Aitabar, uh, I was told that majority of the, the, the people that were thinking of coming from the Uyghur community, from Hamilton and, and other areas in North York, will not come. Why? because they're scared that we are going to take their email. I mean, I'm not going to give it to the CCP, Chinese Communist Party. However, there is such fear with the Uyghurs that live here. Even when I was speaking to them, they had to validate me. Who are you? What's your agenda? I mean, the, this is the psyche of the Uyghur community here, that they are scared even to talk about their profile. Even this, what you heard today, is, is, is a big thing because people have told me in Hamilton, North York, Markham that are Uyghur, if they come out on social media and speak out, they actually have their homes attacked here in Canada. They have their tires slashed. They have people from the Chinese state, some, some agents come out and look outside their homes. When they contact the RCMP, these people are gone. So you have to understand, and it took me a long time actually, <laughs> because we've been trying to arrange this program for the past month and a half, the psyche of the Uyghurs that are living here in the GTA and in Canada, that they are scared to talk about their issues. There was a protest here, uh, or, or the Uyghur Association, Student Association, some Uyghur students who work, uh, who study at the University of Toronto, St. George, downtown. When they tried to talk about the Uyghur issues, they were actually verbally assaulted by the Chinese majority there uh, that were studying there. So much so that they had to ask the University of Toronto for protection for freedom of speech which to at least allow them to speak. So this is uh, the sort of uh, background that, uh, that uh, they uh, inherit. Yes, uh, Brother Naveed. So the 
brother mentioned that uh, in, in the 1980s and the 1990s, things were, things were pretty much fine. So my question is, what triggered the change in the attitude of the Chinese government? That's the question I had. Exactly. Jazakallah. So for the people online, the question from Naveed Ahmed was, I mean, if there were hunky-dory before, everything was fine. What happened that caused people in uh, Urumqi, Kashgar, the Uyghur community? Was it uh, Li Jipen, the new uh, uh, president, who caused this change? Because I believe the, the, the Uyghur people had a protected st uh, status before. They were free to go to their mosque. They were free to have go to their Eidgahs. They were free. What has changed that has caused so much of consternation from 2016 onwards. Yeah, thank you very much, brother, for bringing this kind of uh, important question. Since our country has been occupied since 1949, up until now, the repression always has been there. Even though the year that I just mentioned comparing versus the other years, 1980s to 1990s, those te that 10 years were okay. It wasn't a great, it was okay because we were okay, but this is the situation. Even though we allowed to go to our mosque, our Imam is being watched by the Communist Party. He has to watch what he's going to say to the public, to, to, the, to the Ummah. And he has to bring the good things, say, has to say good things about the Chinese Communist Party. That, hey, the Chinese Communist Party is feeding us. We should obey the Chinese Communist Party all the time. They are the ones creating this kind of opportunity for us to pray to really. Again, because the government of the Chinese government, the Xi Jinping right now, is, he's been elected for his lifetime. Inshallah, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, cursing is a very big scene in Islam. Since this has been happening starting 2016, I've been cursing this guy. I know I'm doing sin, but he deserves it. He deserves more than that because he, because of his direction, because his, his, his order, more than 5 million people, innocent people, they have nothing to do with separatism. They have nothing to do with anything that has a religious perspective. They ended up in jail. My wife's two brothers went to Turkey, went to Holland, Stay in Holland, one stay in Holland four years, another one stay just a month to visit his daughter who lives in Turkey. When they went back, they ended up in concentration camps. And right after, they were in prison, one for five years, another one more than 10 years in prison. What was that for? Because they were visiting other country, carrying the Chinese passport. But again, if I come to your question, those times, this is again, even the Chinese Communist Party, sometimes some Communist Party, they have a system that follow. They have their own way to manage people. In 1980s to 1990s, they were okay. And that's why the, all the Uyghur people, they felt freely to go to mosque, to go anywhere they can, if, as long as they have money. But again, in terms of were they free 100%, were they leave? As, as the other Han Chinese leaves? No, no, not at all. The Uyghur people, since the occupation of my country in 1949, always, always been treated by the Chinese government as a second, even the third degree citizens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. My question remains on answer, then you can answer. What was the trigger? Uh, the, the, this man, uh, Xi Jinping, coming, he caused the change. The status, the, 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 uh, that status also changed, and he wanted to deal with them with a strong uh, uh, arm tactic. Uh, and any riots that had occurred in the past, before it was dealt with in, in a gentle manner, this man uh, is the trigger to have more of a strong arm tactic. Kamran, yes? Uh, 
Like we, I would, I'm just going to hurry it up as well because uh, we have five to seven minutes. The Isha is going to start at eight thirty. So yes, go ahead. Good question. Thank you very much for for coming. Uh, great amount of courage shown by yourself and by your community. May Allah support with a full victory in, in whatever you're doing and however you're you're, you're fighting against this injustice. That's Amen. that's my first point. My second point is, uh, quite frankly speaking, none of us have any hope in any Muslim government standing up for your cause. What can we do here in Canada besides writing to MPs? What can we do specifically to help your communities? Yeah, of course. Brother, like I, I just mentioned in a couple of words that uh, in my last uh, slide of my show, that the Chinese will be having 2022 Winter Olympics coming. Uh, actually, we've been having the protests against China, even against the Canadian government, to not to send any acutes there to ban or just apply the uh, Olympic Committee to cancel, to replace, the, to relocate the dislocation of the, uh, this uh, Winter Olympic year for 2022. For as a Canadian citizen, we can again. As you're telling me that instead of writing something to our, I mean, I mean, these MPs are our representative of calm. I mean, we have to, I mean, we have to force them. We have to tell them, hey, please ask the government to not send any athletes to 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 uh, to the China for Winter Olympic Games. At least tell the government to work against this kind of uh, issue that uh, I heard. The Liberal Party just won the election, and I heard the Trudeau, he himself is going for the opening ceremony for 2022 Olympic Games in China, in Beijing. This is, I mean, in our community, I believe many of the Liberal Party candidates, I think they won the election, especially these areas. My area, Ikhra Khalid, won. Honestly speaking, brothers, I myself, voted against Ikhra Hali. I voted for Conservative Party, who the wish that the, the Conservative Party brought this Uyghur genocide issue to pass the Canadian Parliament. But unfortunately, the Liberal Party is not coming to that point yet. So we have to enforce them. We have to enforce our MPs to think this way, you know? Right now, two miles because they returned. We've been hearing like four years that like two Michaels, they need to be returned to their home. We have a Uyghur imam was captured. He went to Uzbekistan and returned to back to China. He's in prison now more than 10 years now. And Canada is not saying anything, any words. And he has one disabled child who reached up 20 years old. And he has also three sons. They're all grown now. So we have to tell the government to also force the Chinese government to bring them back to reunite them with their family. This is Jalil Hussein? Hussein Jalil. Yes. This is Hussein Jalil. Yes. He, was, he used to be imam of uh, Hamilton Mosque. Yes, and uh, uh, Mr. Harun uh, Siddiqui, uh, emeritus at the Toronto Star, he has also written an article about Jalil saying, we hear about the Michaels, Pavors, but we haven't heard about the Jalils, who is also a Canadian citizen with the same rights. Uh, so, uh, are there any other uh, questions? Actually, before we ask, are there any other questions I, I can take? But something I want the Muslims here to know. We heard from Brother Etibar, and we heard about the tactics that are used. I've been working with Brother Taha and, uh, you know, uh, Brother Hassan Kazi on Justice for All. This is not new. The Rohingya was the same way. Similar to the playbook that the Chinese have used, the Rohingya has used the same way. They had the men two years before taken off, 18 to 40 or 18 to 50, taken into concentration camps. The women were all alone in, uh, in Myanmar. After two years of terrorizing them in the evening and whatnot, then the, the, the army came in, burnt the Muslim areas in Arakan state and so on. The women and the old people fled, as you saw in 2017 and so on. We heard about the Rohingya people and they moved to, uh, they, they fled for their lives to, to Cox's Bazaar now in Bangladesh. Kashmir, 
the dispossession of the people there. We have been following that same sort of playbook. Um, Palestine, Bantu stands and everything. We know how that is happening, okay? So I, I want the, the people here in the audience to know that this is not new. The Muslims have been persecuted, but the playbook now is becoming solidified. So the moment you start hearing things of vocational retraining and you know all of these things, this is just a entry of people to say that now we're going to start putting pressure on the Muslims to eradicate their sense of identity, their sense of language, their sense of a uh, 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 link to the land. So it's very important that you on your social media platform, especially the youth, bring these sort of things up. I mean, TikTok, I do not know. I don't consider TikTok much, but if uh, Sister Feroza is, is doing something there, that's, that's great. But social media is a platform that you can use. I'm more into the MPs and everything, but that's not the only avenue. Social media, talking about it with your circles, talking about it, educating people in libraries once things open up. So these are all avenues with dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change the condition. And our objective here was to make sure that we are educating the ummah, uh, the community here. And we hope that uh, this has been uh, a valuable sort of program and that you, you are going to go back and at least be aware of what is happening in China. And if someone says, no, 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 the Uyghur thing, it's, it's not nothing like that. It's a Western hoax. You know it's not a hoax because of the information that has been given to you today by, by uh, Brother Etabar and other people that are here uh, from uh, the Uyghur community. So Jazakallah Khairan, I'm going to uh, conclude the program. Uh, Jazakallah for your time. If, if there are any other questions, we can uh, wait. Yes, Brother uh, Moyudin. Okay. okay. I mean, uh, the question I have has to do with uh, considering the situation of, of the Uyghur people and the fact that, in a way, uh, they see the Muslim community supporting the Chinese government. Yes. So, what has been their motivation? To remain within Islam. Because I mean, they're not getting support, and also they do, sometimes they don't have mistrust. Yes. So, what has been the motivation? There are most of the leaders, right? Can you repeat the question. Okay, so Brother Moedin's question is that um, if, if the Uyghur community have been disillusioned with the Muslim response from a government perspective, maybe even from the community here, um, what, how? What has kept him within the, the, the folds of Islam if the Ummah, you know, quote, is not existing right now or not helping them? How does uh, Brother uh, Etabar uh, feel and um, how does he respond to, to the response that he's seen from the Muslim, Muslim community here? Uh, thank you very much, Brother, for your question. Uh, we do have this kind of uh, discussion uh, many places so far. So unfortunately, they haven't received any positive feedback yet, to be honest. I'm just honestly speaking. So, of course, none of the Muslim country at the moment, they're responding or this genocide issue at the moment because they, they got a lot of money from China that they, have, they need to pay back. Uh, that is one strategy that China is owing these countries, I should say. But I'm telling you again, within the 10 to 20 years, China will own all these lands, all these countries that they already they give them a lot of money. Uh, but right now, that our Uyghur genocide has been recognized by six countries so far. Those are the US, the Canada, Belgium, Lithuania, um, Czech Republic, and one more country that I, need, I, I forgot. So six countries has recognized the Uyghur genocide. Right now, in, 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 in England, in Britain, uh, the Uyghur tribal burial is going on right now. So they're going to, they just finished the second uh, steps, and then they're going, coming back for the third steps to finalizing it because they are listening to all these witnesses, the Uyghur witnesses that I just explained to you, I just showed you all these uh, uh, witnesses, the former detainees, they're telling what they had experienced because they just want to make the conclusion that whether this is a really genocide or not. I'm hoping that they're going to come with the conclusion that yes, this is a real genocide. After 
when they uh, have that com uh, come to that conclusion, inshallah, our expectation is a lot of country, including I inshallah, one or two Muslim country, inshallah, we recognize that we were genocide. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. Yes, Brother Majid. I just want to say one thing that you have to remind everybody that the Rohingya uh, genocide was happening for 10, 15, 20 years. Uma was totally silent for that time. As a result of that, it has emboldened other countries to do this because they found that as a Uma, we are dead. And now, Assam, India, Kashmir, Rohingya, one yes. after another, this is we're happening. Falling. And we all thinking we are safe in our area. In our homes, yes. But the time, it's just a matter of time. If we keep doing that, it can happen anywhere in the world. Nobody is safe. Right. So Dr. Ma Majid Kazi is basically mentioning that uh, uh, what has happened is that when the Rohingya um, uh, and, uh, were being, uh, there was a genocide carried against them, uh, the Muslim Ummah was silent. Uh, yes. as, as a whole. And because of that, the people that were the enemies of, of Muslims in different parts of the world, they were emboldened to say, if the Muslims are dead as an ummah, they don't feel for each other, then we can do anything we want, whether it's in Palestine, whether it's in, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's in uh, uh, China, whether it's in the Philippines, whether it's Assam. in uh, Rohingya, whether it's in Pakistan, wherever, Assam, sorry, Assam, uh, wherever it may be. So we, we need to realize that our actions, we will be held responsible uh, on the day of Yom al Qiyamah, what did we do? Now, from my our perspective, we've created a program just to create awareness on the issue. This is a first step. The next steps are with you all. Jazakallah khair.